On behalf of the First Baptist Church family here in Pulaski, Tennessee, thank you so much for joining us for this worship service. We think you'll pretty quickly see that we are not a bunch of spit and polished professionals. We're not the most gifted people around. As a matter of fact, we make all kinds of mistakes. We're a long way from perfect. And maybe you can relate to us in that way. And that's okay because our belief is that God's Son, Jesus Christ, is the only perfect person who ever lived. And Jesus took His perfection and did something amazing with it. He offered Himself as payment for our sins, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit, and is right now preparing a place for us to be with Him. The service you're about to watch, hiccups and all, is not about us performing for God, each other, or you. This service is about a bunch of imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We have prayed that God meets you right where you are as you enter into this service with us. And if you're ever able, we would be thrilled for you to join us live and in person. May the living God be glorified in this service, in our lives, and in yours, now and forever. And again, thank you so much for joining us. for you guys today. What is a role model? Someone that you look up to. So is it somebody that's really, really tall? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. So, no, but you were right. Somebody that you look up to, somebody that you respect, somebody that you want to be like. So it could be somebody famous. It's like a singer or an actor, or it could be uh, somebody that on your favorite TV show. Um, it could be somebody in real life that you know, like, uh, like a teacher from school or maybe uh, your Sunday school teacher, or your parents, or somebody in your family, but basically somebody that you just think is great, and somebody who you want to be just like. So um, do any of, you, any of you guys have somebody like that that you just really look up to? Want to share? Who's somebody you, that you like a lot and look up to? I like dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Well, dinosaurs, you, you would definitely look up to them. They're tall? Yes, all right. What about a person that you really admire or appreciate or you, you think? You got one? No? So Alex is looking for a role model, guys. So you got my, you, if you're a good enough example, he might follow you. Who you got? God. God? God. Well, you can't go wrong there. Yeah, but, and it's okay if you, if you don't want to share. But we have lots of people that we may see that we think, man, they are great. They do such a great job. I want to be just like them. And... You know, we've been talking about some people in Children's Church the past several weeks that we said that we would want to be like. We are Bible heroes. We've been talking about Bible heroes for, uh, for a while now. And we've talked about how they had these great qualities that we called their superpowers and how we would want to be like that. And some of those superpowers were loyalty. Do you guys remember who loyalty was? Who was loyal? Ruth. And... Um, Self-control, David, very good. Um, what about wisdom? Solomon, very good. Yeah, so those are some of the ones we talked about and their superpowers, and we talked about how we want to be wise and be loyal and be things like them. But, you know, if, even if we had a Bible hero as a, as a role model or if we had somebody in our life that we know as a role model, would they be perfect? No, no, even the people in the Bible messed up. In fact, we only told the best parts about them when we learned about them, but there's some stuff in the Bible, some stuff that they did that wasn't so godly, and that wasn't really things that they should do. So, we're, there are people that we want to be like, but nobody is perfect. So, if we wanted to follow the perfect role model, the perfect person, who would we have to follow? Jesus. Very good. We have to follow Jesus. And Jesus is somebody we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about his life and just um, just his, his, the days that he lived on earth and all the miracles that he did and a lot of stuff about him leading up to him dying on the cross for our sins. And we're going to be talking about him all the way leading up to Easter. And you know, he is a perfect role model for us. And you know, when we become a Christian, when we have a relationship with God through Jesus, you know who the Bible tells us we're supposed to act like? 
Jesus, yes. In fact, Paul says this in Ephesians. Imitate God in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. And we can go on and on about how great of an example that, that Jesus is, but we're called to be like him and to live like he and to live a life that he, like kind of like how he did, how he loved people, forgave people and showed truth to them. So we're supposed to be like that. So we're going to be talking more about him and his life over the next few weeks and talking about Easter, but right now let's pray together. Dear God, we love you and just thank you just for being who you are and um, we just pray that as we move into the worship service that you help us to focus on you and giving praise to you. And I just ask that all of our worship today is pleasing to you and you help us just learn more about you and how we can be more like Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So let's stand and let's sing hymn number 96, Great is Thy Faithfulness. We're going to sing verses 1 and 3. given to us through his son. So let's sing your grace is enough.
we're going to sing is one that's really familiar. It's called Forever, and we're going to praise God for forever being with us, no matter what, always seeking us. Here we go. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. The mighty hand and outstretched arm. Truly, God, you are with us forever. Um, just, we, we are amazed at how wonderful and marvelous you are. And we thank you for what all you have given us. And help us never take that for granted, Lord. Just forgive us of our sins and help us be quick in forgiving others. We just pray for the missionaries that are out there now, Lord, and our upcoming mission trips. Um, we just thank you for your hope and your grace, um, for your mercy, Lord. And just, um, we pray for those that are lost, Lord. Um, just lost family members, lost friends. Just help us have a, have a heart to reach out to them, Lord, and soften their hearts. We pray, well, and this offering we're about to take up, Lord, um, we pray that it is used according to your will. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It makes all the difference in the world to us, no matter what our circumstances are, to know that his eye, like it's on the sparrow, is on us. He does care. He is watching. He is faithful. He is attentive. And I think something we'll pick up on in the passage of the day today is that he's doing things even when, when we don't anticipate or see them. He is at work. Uh, for God con God's continuing word to us, we're headed to Mark chapter 4, verses 26 and following. That's page 650 in those short pew Bibles and 922 in the taller ones. We're continuing our series here through some parables in the book of Mark. And if you're new to us, just as a little bit of a refresher, a parable is basically a story, a true-to-life story that's cast alongside um, a real-life kind of situation or event basically to make one spiritual point. But it has two primary purposes, the first of which is to call non-Christians or those who don't yet know Jesus personally to consider the truth of who he is. So as we work through these, these there are actually two parables we're going to look at today. As we work through these, if you're a person who's never made a move of your heart to place your faith in Christ, you've never admitted to God that you're a sinner in need of forgiveness, his invitation to you is to confess your sin before him and receive the gift of eternal life through faith in Christ. So a parable is, first of all, a call to consider Christ. And for those of us who have taken that step of faith, the next 
part of a parable, purpose of a parable, is for us to consider God's additional or deeper truths beyond that. Um, so that's basically what's, what we've been learning. Our first parable that we looked at is probably the most famous parable of all the parables, the parable of the soils, we called it. And it was in Mark, early, early part of Mark chapter 4, which basically taught us that the condition of a person's heart determines how much lasting impact God's truths will make in and through that person. So we learned that. Last week we talked about the parable of, of the oil lamp or the lamp stand, however you want to look at it. And what we learned there was the degree to which one applies God's truths determines whether or not that person receives more from the Lord. So those are things we've been learning in the parables today. Again, we're in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 and following, and we'll pick up on some other things. But uh, you, you'll notice beginning in verse 26, the kingdom of God is like this, Jesus said. Now, if you're a Bible student at all, when you read the kingdom of God, it's one of those things that we sort of understand, but we kind of don't sometimes understand. Uh, this is actually a very contentious, if you will, concept in, um, in theological circles, students of God's word that talk about this and kind of thumb wrestle about this. What does this mean, the kingdom of God? It's actually kind of a complicated um, issue, quite honestly. Some people are going to say the kingdom of God, as it's discussed in the Bible, has mostly to do with our hearts, that it's a condition of our heart that, that God wants to reign in our hearts. Other people are going to say, no, it's, it's more of an earthly thing. It's a physical kingdom. Uh, and, and still others are going to sharpen the pencil on that a little bit more and say, not only is it an earthly kingdom, it's a millennial earthly kingdom. Uh, after the Lord's second coming, after his return, those who believe in the millennium uh, are going to say that God will set up a, a literal thousand-year reign through his son, and that's what's being referred to with, with the kingdom. And Jesus is offering that to the Jews and all this. Look, it gets pretty complicated. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's hard to interpret. But for the purposes of today... And, and I, traded, um, I traded emails with one of our Sunday school teachers this week about the parable of the soils, which was kind of fun because we were kicking ideas back and forth about what some of those things might mean. Uh, and here's the beauty of how God works uh, in, in his word. There are levels of meaning. There are applicational things that can be taken at different points. We have to be careful not to misunderstand or misidentify truth because then we would misapply truth. But in all of those examples I just gave you about what the kingdom could be, all of them could be described this way. And this is, I'm borrowing from Dallas Willard here. Uh, if you want to join me in, in, in the, the book reading club I'm in, I'm just reading it with one of my friends, actually. Uh, but it's a book called The Divine Conspiracy. Uh, it's a pretty powerful book. It's not one that you're going to read uh, over lunch uh, quickly. But in that book, in the first chapter, he talks about the kingdom of God. And he, Dallas Willard, uses, I've adapted his definition, but it's basically this. A kingdom means the range of one's effective will. The range of one's effective will. So if you think about that in the context of Scripture, God's kingdom, and Jesus just said this, the kingdom of God is like this. The range, how far-reaching... God's effective will is. Now think about that for just a second. God's kingdom, the range, the limits of his effective will is his kingdom. So that becomes pretty helpful. Um, you may have heard it said with me that if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. You've probably heard that said. Is that true? If Jesus isn't Lord of all, He's not Lord at all. I've heard that several times. Now, I think that's true and it's not true. In my own personal life, the range of God's effective will in my own life, can I say, well, I'm going to do this group of things that I know please you, Lord, but I'm going to do this group of things over here that don't please you, that gratify my flesh. I'm going to do these things your way, but I'm going to do these things my way. Where is the range of God's effective will in my life? It stops. You see what I'm saying? I have put a fence around those things that I'm going to submit to God. So the range of his effective will in my own heart only extends part of the way. So in one way of saying it, if God is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all in, in the sense that 
Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Why are you calling me Lord in your quiet times? Why are you calling me Lord in your prayers? Why are you writing Lord on post-it notes or telling your friends that, that I'm your Lord when you're not doing what I'm saying? That's pretty convicting. So for those of us who name his name, those of us who have been uh, bought by the blood, those of us who are his, for us to say he's our Lord, there should be no limits to the range of his effective will in our lives. Every closet door of our hearts, every cupboard in our lives, everything should be open to his cleaning and his control. Everything. So in one sense, I'm, I'm with many of you probably, with my attitudes or my behaviors or my actions or whatever those things are, sometimes I don't behave as if he's my Lord. Sometimes I don't think, I don't submit all of my choices the words that come out of my mouth, the, the, the way that I um, respond to my children, the, the television or the movies I watch or the music that I listen to or whatever, sometimes those things are not in the span of his effective will because I know that there are things that I should submit to him that I don't. Okay, so in one sense, that statement, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all is true, but in another way it's not true. And the way it's not true is that if you grew up living in, in Monaco or Spain or something like that, where there's, there's this uh, monarchy kind of structure, um, and you're driving down the road in, in one of these monarchies, and the king or the queen has established a law that you choose to break. Just because you chose to break the law, does that mean they're not the king or the queen anymore? The range of their effective will did not capture your behavior, but does that take them off the throne? No, it doesn't. So when you and I act as if God is not the Lord of all, does that mean he's not? No. He is the Lord of all. He is on the throne. He is the sovereign. He is in charge. And in, in heaven and earth, there will come a time where he's going to set everything right. And in Christ, he's done it. It's already a done deal. We know who wins. But in terms of time and space and the human condition, all that stuff has not yet come to fruition. But the range of his effective will will capture us all and all that kingdom thumb wrestling stuff that all these theologians are talking about, it'll all make sense in not too long from now. It'll all be clear. God's kingdom will one day be over all the earth, over all the universe, a new heaven and the new earth. There will not be a stain of sin. There won't be a tear. There won't be mourning, crying, disease, sickness, pain, or death. It'll all be gone, and the new order of things has come. The range of his effective will will be total and complete. But the question before us today, more practically speaking, does the range of God's effective will, does his kingdom extend into each of our lives, our hearts, our relationships, our job? Our school, the way we play sports, the way we talk to each other, the way we serve the poor, the way we vote, the way we, whatever our thing is, does the range of his effective will um, indicate that his kingdom has come in our hearts? Jesus in the model prayer. It's, he's not saying, your kingdom come one day, your will be done one day. Your kingdom has come through Jesus. The reign of God on planet earth, the reign of God through God's people. Your kingdom has come in the person of Christ, but may the range of your effective will continue in the church. It's pretty powerful. And that's, that's along the lines of what we're supposed to be picking up on now. And, and within that sort of framework... If you're about the Lord's business, do you ever get tired of having to behave? You know, do you ever get tired of having to be the, the adult, to be the mature one? Everybody else is just playing around. The people around you are just being selfish and you have to serve. They're takers and you're the giver. They're living like the world. They're doing their own thing. They're chasing money. They're chasing women. They're chasing men. They're chasing empty satisfaction. They're chasing fulfillment through whatever it might be. And you're 
staying the course in your kind of boring life? Or do you ever feel anything like that? You feel like maybe you, it's just kind of wasted. Or are you ever the person who in your family is the only Christian? Or in your circle of influence, you're the only believer? Or you're in a community setting or you're somewhere at work where you're holding out the light of Christ day after day after day after day after day. You're the one whose speech is clean and it's not like you're trying to beat people up with it. You're just trying to be light in the darkness. You're trying to be love in a world that doesn't really know the love of God. You're trying to speak truth in love. You're trying to share the gospel. You're trying to talk about Jesus. You're trying to give testimony to the fact that God is alive and at work in this world. And you see nothing. Imagine being a missionary, a Christian missionary uh, in the Middle East. On a Muslim mission field. Living your whole life and never seeing a convert. Imagine that. But some of you can't imagine that. Because you're sharing and you're giving and you're praying and you're working and you don't see anything happening. And this, this parable is for us. Those of us that struggle in moments like that. If we're discouraged, God has a word for us. Continuing in verse 26. The kingdom of God is like this. He said, a man scatters seed on the ground. He sleeps and he rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows but he doesn't know how is there anything in you that resonates with being that sower that's loving on kids at ball practice loving on your own kids talking to your parents about things of faith talking to people at work and you don't see anything happening you've sown the seed you've shared the truth you've loved on them as best you can and if you let yourself, you would quit. You'd get discouraged. But you love them too much to quit. But you don't see anything happening. But it says again in verse 27, the seed sprouts and grows, but the sower doesn't know how. Growth is happening. Things are going on beneath the surface of hearts and minds that you and I can't see, that only God and those people see. Only God fully understands even, I would submit to you. But things are happening. If we had time this morning, and by the way, it is our custom as a church a couple times a year to have a testimony Sunday. And sometime this spring, in the grace of God, we'll do just that. And maybe somebody can share a testimony along these lines, but where, where just one day, in a day that looked like every other day, something clicked for you. Some truth, the truth about Christ, the truth about forgiveness, the truth about what love looks like, the truth about peace, the, the power of prayer, the, these sorts of things. It's like you'd heard it a thousand times, and it just clicks one day, and you get it. You can maybe give a testimony about what that looks like because things are going on that you couldn't perceive in your life or someone else's. Notice in verse 28, the soil produces a crop by itself. First the blade, then the head, and then the ripe grain on the head. So these plants, these seeds, the soil is growing. The emphasis in this particular passage, again, is not on the seed or the sower. It's not like the previous parable. The parable is making one central point, one big idea. And I think the point of this particular parable is along the lines of this. God's supernaturally empowered truths or his work will bear fruit in time. They will bear fruit in time. Not my time, maybe. Not your time, maybe. But in his time, they will. If you and I could talk to that missionary on the Muslim mission field, we would tell him or tell her, don't give up. Please don't give up. Please don't quit. If you and I could talk to that single mom who's trying to teach her kids what it means to trust the Lord, we would tell her, don't quit. Please don't quit. Don't cash in your chips. Don't give up persevere. That couple struggling in their marriage, please don't cash in your chips. Please don't quit. God is doing things in your spouse you don't see. Don't be the one who lays down. Whatever that issue is. Because, again, there will come a time, I believe in the grace of God, that something will happen. Something can click. And, and for us to quit and us to not trust the faithfulness of God that we sang about, is to sell him short. 
He's doing things we don't see. And as soon as the crop is ready, he will harvest. He will bring fruit from that. Verse 29, as soon as the crop is ready, he sends for the sickle because the harvest has come. Now, we as evangelical sort of Baptist Christians, we tend to think that is that means judgment. That's the end of time and all of that sort of... That's not the point of this particular parable. I think, I think again, because of the way the Lord inspired his word, there are two levels to this. The first level might be that someone understands at an unexpected time the truth of Christ. Acts chapter 9, I think it is... Paul, um, it, we're, it, it meets the Lord on the road to Damascus, and, it's, and it says it's like the scales fall off his eyes kind of thing. In chapter 9, it talks about that moment where he, he understands, you know, Lord, he finally sees kind of deal. So seeing unto salvation can happen one day. The harvest comes, but also... We might think, and you don't need to turn there, I'll just read it to you, but we might think about that end time when the harvest comes. I'm going to read from Mark chapter 13, verse 32 and following. Now concerning the day or the hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the sun, except the Father. Watch, be alert. You don't know when the time is coming. It's like a man on a journey who left his house, gave authority to his slaves, gave each one his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to be alert. Therefore, be alert, since you don't know when the master of the house is coming whether in the evening or at midnight or the crowing of the rooster or in the early morning. Otherwise, he might come suddenly and find you sleeping. And I say to you, I say to everyone, be alert. It could be that he's talking about the harvest of faith and, and someone coming to faith, but it could also be talking about the fact that the end time is coming. Either way, God's supernaturally empowered truths, his work will bear fruit in time. Believe it. Trust him. Keep ministering. Don't give up. Don't stop sharing. Don't stop praying. Don't stop living out the truth of who God is for those around you to see. Another insight he wants to give us through the next parable has to do with the mustard seed, also a pretty famous parable. And I would tell you this, that in, in Matthew and Luke, the emphasis on this particular parable has mostly to do with a little bit of faith does a lot. That's sort of the message. This message is a little bit different, and I think we'll see it in just a second. Verse 30, he said, how can we illustrate the kingdom of God? Remember the range of effective control? How can we illustrate the kingdom of God, or what parable can we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed when sown in the soil is smaller than all the seeds on the ground. And when sown, it comes up and grows taller than all the vegetables and produces large branches so the birds of the sky can nest in its shade. Now, properly speaking, if you're a botanist or you're a, um, you know, a plant lover and you know a little bit about mustard and where it comes from, it comes from a plant that looks like the one I have on the screen here, and which is about normally a pretty short thing, a pretty short plant. This is the typical plant. In that particular day, and Wikipedia didn't have a free picture for me to use, so I had to use the one that they had that was free, uh, just for illustration purposes. Um, this is a seed that's about two to three millimeters across, tiny little thing. And a plant in, in Palestine that would grow, the black mustard plant would grow to be not, not waist high to a child, but shoulder or head high to an adult, maybe even up to nine feet tall. The point is not the mustard plant. That's not the point. Because even a plant of that type, the black mustard tree, wouldn't normally grow that tall. The point is this. Something that small grows into something unexpectedly, mystically, surprisingly large. And therein lies the point of this parable. It would have surprised the original hearers to hear what Jesus was saying about the mustard seed. Yes, in Matthew and Luke, it's talking about the, our faith being like a mustard seed. If we have faith the size of a mustard seed, God can do big things. Here, the emphasis is, is more on the kingdom idea and, and what God is, God is working to do. And here's what I think is basically the essence of this passage or this parable, this teaching, the seemingly insignificant beginnings of God's work will one day be mystifyingly, if, if that's even a word, large. Do you ever feel like 
And maybe if you're, you're like me, you sat the bench in a sport. Um, you, you weren't one of the starters. I was on a baseball team in high school. My sophomore year, I didn't even have a jersey. I just had a t-shirt that went under my jersey. And there I sat on the bench, wanting to play. You're not even a B-teamer. I was a catcher. So you're the guy that gets to catch the worst pitcher in practice and then not have a jersey. That was me my sophomore year in high school. And you're, you're on the, you don't even on the B team. You're on the C team. You're on the almost no team. And you so want to play. You so want to make a difference. You so want to be significant. You so, it's not about ego. It's just wanting to contribute. And, and in the wake of the parable that we just had to, to slant this toward things of the faith, we, we, ought to, we ought to all be trusting that God's doing things we can't see. But if we're wanting to make a difference, sometimes in, in our faith journey and in our ministry journey, we don't feel like we're making a difference. And, and we don't feel like the little bit that we are offering, God's doing anything with. And what he's reminding us is, is that He's doing things we can't see. His work is powerful, but he is going to do something bigger, something that's mystifying through each of us and through the work of the church that will blow your mind. He does a little with a lot, or he does a lot with a little. That's what I meant to say. He does a lot with a little. He can take a little and do a lot. And we're supposed to be encouraged by that. Because sometimes, like Christians, particularly in our, it seems that in this increasingly hostile world against Christians, we're getting squeezed down and squeezed down and squeezed down and squeezed down and marginalized and marginalized and marginalized. Our culture is changing, our morals are changing, the values are changing. We're getting pushed toward the periphery. The Christian voice doesn't seem like it's one that's heard very much in our society or in our world at times. And you feel like you're on the bench with no jersey. Like you're not making a difference. And God's saying, no, 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 no. Don't underestimate, not yourselves, but don't underestimate me. Don't underestimate the work that I'm doing. It, it, instead of the bench sort of idea and not having a jersey, it's more like Apple. Now, now if you think about the, the company... Apple, Macintosh, all of that. Apple's initial offering, their, their official IPO on the stock market was in 1980 at $22 a share. Since that time, Apple stock has split two for one on three separate occasions in 1987, 2000, and 2005. In 2014, just two years ago, Apple stock split one to seven. And basically what that means, if you had you would have 56 shares today for every share you had then, okay? So let's say you had $5,000 to invest in Apple when it started. Just for fun, if you had invested $5,000 in Apple in 1980, do you know how much money you would have having never touched anything again and just rolled over and stayed and all that? You know what that investment would be worth? Somewhere, depending on how you calculate it with, with fractional shares and all this sort of stuff and interest and whether or not the dividends were reinvested. Okay, somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5 million dollars. Five thousand dollars would now be 1.3 to 1.5 million. That's what we're talking about. That's what God is doing through his people. That mind-blowing increase, mustard seed to a, a, a mustard plant or something that birds could land in, is the kind of work that he is doing through little old you and little old me if we're yielded. Don't doubt it. Don't think those words to your kids, your grandkids, the kids on your sports team, your clients, your bosses. Don't think those words, those truths, those gifts, those love. That love is not making a difference. In, in his grace, he's keeping us from understanding all the work he's doing. 
because half the time we'd want to take credit for it. But he is doing mind-blowing, mystifying things from the first, well, from time, since when time began to now, but it's unbelievable what God is doing. It is literally unbelievable. It is that impressive and that large. Our humble, seemingly insignificant beginnings, our little bitty tiny gifts, God is doing huge things through. And some of us could testify that with people that made little, some, a touch from an aunt or an uncle on our shoulder when we were discouraged, a note from a friend or this or that or whatever, some little thing made a huge difference in our lives and they don't even know it. You are making that difference in other people's lives and you don't know it. Because God in His grace is that kind of God that He's doing that. We're about to sing a song here together, day by day, with each passing moment. And it, it speaks to how God is working in and through us in the little things of life. I'd ask you know, anybody that's helping the music to come on forward. I would also invite you to stand, if you would, with us. And if you would, we'll just um, say a word of prayer of dedication to our time of invitation. We'll open in the altar. Respond as you're led, but at least, please, at least, meditate on what we're singing about. And see if that rings in your soul the way God would have it. Because he's looking to do big things in and through you. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, how could we not marvel at the idea that you are doing powerful things, even when we're discouraged that we can't see, or mind-blowingly large things through our little expressions of faith and love for you. Lord, you have brought people to our hearts and to our minds as we've been sharing that we so want to know the truth of who your son is. Lord, we, we so want them and us to experience the deeper things of a walk with you that's alive. Lord, help this time not be empty. Help us be energized by bigger, better thoughts of you as we even sing this song about how you are with us every moment of every day, even in the little things. Lord, we give you this time. Take it and use it. Let your kingdom reign, the extent of your effective will, and close our hearts now. We pray in Christ. Amen.
if you would just bow your heads and spend a little time in quiet before the Lord. requests before you now that um, that we've brought and Lord where we need to we pray that you would help us just take our hands off of them and leave them there knowing that you're doing things we can't see Lord give us strength and perseverance give us the kind of faith that endures help us be faithful as you are faithful help us be holy as you are holy Lord, for all of us, again, we just pray that the fence of your effective will would enclose our hearts and that we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't want to play outside the fence, Lord, that we just, as, as your kids get serious in love uh, to respond to you, Lord, we give you ourselves, we give you um, all these prayers, these people that we've just brought to your throne, we, we just ask that you would do big things that would magnify your name. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.